All right, get to it, yep. Those jokes will keep on coming, <laughs> believe me. Uh, so we're gonna talk today about UGET, that is Git, PowerShell, and the object pipeline together. First, the obligatory brief introduction slide that ends up on almost every one of my talks. Hey, I'm James Brundage with Start Automating. Actually, fun preview. Now have a second company too. Been doing scripting for 16 years and counting. I helped build PowerShell v2 and v3. You're welcome slash I'm sorry. Um, and I have been working in it ever since. I formed one of the first PowerShell consultancies and I've made a life's work out of growing the language. It's a rewarding life's work overall. I love making useful tools and interesting toys with PowerShell. And I also love kind of continuing to evolve technique and show people what PowerShell is really capable of. Today, we're gonna to look a little module and how it's made, and maybe change a few minds. <sighs> so it's called UGIT. UGIT stands for updated Git, or slide deck titles, updating Git though, you know, it's verbs. Like all developers, I've gotta use Git. Uh, I don't really have to like it. If you like Git, you're welcome to raise your hand and we can all laugh at you for a little bit. But I, at this point, wrote, write whole toolkits around Git and while I'm developing a light fascination with certain or aspects of it, I still hate its guts. It's still a big pain in my ass too. It does mean that I have to get better over time though. And as I do more and more releases, more and more stuff on GitHub, I have to keep getting better at Git. As I work with more companies that are Git-based, I have to keep getting better at Git. So say we all. Git is really great for source control. It really is. It, it, there's a reason why it's like about 90% of the market at this point, and that reason is basically branches. Uh, but it gets just a little bit awkward in PowerShell, and this is because it kind of does one of those cardinal PowerShell sins that we expect from every executable, it doesn't give objects. It gives you text. That really shouldn't be. What if we could do something about that? And this is where, uh, if Joel Bennett is not in the room, he's still getting a third of the blame because you get kind of started um, off of a, hey, what would happen if? Little Discord chat between me and Joel Bennett. See, PowerShell's great at parsing. What if I could just wrap Git? and update it a little bit and parse what comes out of Git. So this doesn't seem too bad, right? You know, famous last words. Well, to start off, I had to get a little crafty. I've wrapped a few apps in my time and they're all pain in the butt, but they all, I often find that if I write a commandlet around an application, it doesn't really get as used as I'd like. I don't know if anybody else has that same experience. They, make so much effort trying to write a wrapper around blah.exe, but there's so much muscle memory around blah.exe that they don't actually use it. If you spent the time to learn a command line, you might not want to learn a commandlet. Can we thread this needle? Can we make it so that you can take what you've learned on the command line and still use it and get it in an object pipeline form? Yes, if we get a little crafty. Now, before we get into a bit of the how, I figure it's best to give everybody a little bit of a taste. Uh, but I have a slide that I rearranged, so this might have one bit of bad lead in here, sorry. Um, let's go ahead and launch a demo file and do some wowness. First, let's get this over on that screen. Everybody see it? Okay, so I'm gonna re-import uget from the local directory. I'm currently on 039, which came out a couple days ago. And, yes sir? Zoom in. Uh, hold up a second, I've got a trackpad mouse that I'm trying to get over to this thing. Let's just collapse that, if I can. Uh, 
Everybody better? Except for that? All right. Matt, demo gods tempted enough? Probably not. Okay, we imported this module. I'm also gonna import this module that I wrote a few months ago that gives us demo files in PowerShell. So star.demo.ps1 is back. And then I can just go ahead and do this. We already said what it does at a high level, but hey, it'll type it out for you too. When you use git, it returns objects, not files. So I can git log and one. And you might already notice from the formatting that's a little bit more object-like than you're used to in git. But if you don't believe me, go ahead, pipe to get member. This is where we start to get actually really cool. I have script methods on this. I can archive any given log entry. I can check it out. I can diff. I can reset. I can revert. I can get all the output lines from Git. I can get the root directory. I can get username, email, whether it's been merged or not, and it's merge hash. It's fun. I can also pipe into Git commands, and I will have a slight caveat. I, I believe I did break something in 0 0.39. I can't pipe directories at the moment. That was one of the really cool ones because you could just pipe over all of the Git repositories you have in a given directory and do, you know, a single thing on each, like get all our logs. But yeah, I can go ahead and get the changes to you git.psd1 by piping that to get item. Bada bing, bada boom, done. Of course, git logs ain't all. There's a bunch of other commands that git, you get supports. Thing of it is, I don't really want this demo file to be that dangerous. So I'm not going to do like adds and removes and actual commits, but trust me, those work too. I use them every day. So git branch, in this particular box, I got a main branch, a new branch, and a test this. I think to show somebody else last year, hey, here's how you tell if you don't have an upstream. You can use the object pipeline to filter out the current branch with stuff like that. Isn't that nice and readable? Another cool thing that you can do is what if. And this on mini book, what if and confirm. But I could say go delete all the branches and what if and get back the command line. Mini bug there, it, it actually would have passed dash D, just it's not spitting it back out in the what if. I can also get status. Relatively clear, I've got a random zip. I actually don't know what I put in blah.zip or why I called it blah.zip. Just lazy one day. But I don't have anything to commit. I'm happy about that. So I'm gonna make a little file and we should be able to see that in our untracked because it's an object now. And by the way, untracked is a file. An actual, honest to God, IO file info object from your untracked files. This is very nice, right? We can get diffs too, fingers crossed. Not displaying in my demo, I don't know why. I'll show you more in this bit. So it's obviously not gonna say that I have diff files. Um, I really, really wish that was a little bit more demo friendly because some of the uh, formatters for this are very colorful and diff is about as brightly colored as your regular git diff but also with the metadata of here were the files that were changed, here were the change sets, here were the lines that were changed on, all again as objects. Now, last year, there was a question about a Pandora's box. You get did not add any parameters at that point. And everybody said, you know, I'd love for Git to have easy PowerShell parameters. So after much hemming and hawing, that Pandora's box was open in 038, so pretty freshly opened. And now we have a lot of convenience parameters and more in you get. So you can do something like git log dash after, passing an actual date time, dynamic parameters in you get. Okay. This one's probably not going to give any output because I'm pretty sure I'm on main right now, but I can do this. If I'm on main, it should warn me and spit out if I'm lucky, and if not, it should return nothing. If I am on a given branch, we can start using dash current branch to get 
main dot dot thing. And actually, to be really technical, it goes and figures out what remote name you use. So whether you use main or you haven't updated your repos and you still use master, it'll work. Now, this one I wanted to point out is just crazy plans. Oh boy. Uh, the Pandora's box of opening up parameters is that you can potentially accidentally hide a real Git parameter. And this is an easy thing to work around with UGit. You literally just put it in single quotes. But it's nice to understand what parameters you might be messing up, and sometimes that leads you to fun places. Turns out Git log has dash capital S, which searches string, and dash capital G, which searches for a pattern inside of the body of the commit. So here is every log entry that references the word module version. I didn't even know you could do this and get until like last weekend. All I ended up figuring out was, oh, I didn't want to accidentally override a parameter. What would I be overriding? Oh my God, that's cool. So oh yeah. Another fun convenience one is git log dash issue number. So let's go find all the commits related to issue number one. Yeah, only one of them. Some other improvements are really subtle. For instance, uh, I did a Twitter poll asking about this. Everybody was like, yes, please. Git clone will now always add double dash progress. And double dash progress turns into write progress. So I'm going to clone you git. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you ever cloned a really large repo, but <sighs> you'll want that. So let's clean that repo up before I you know, mess anything else up. Now let's talk a little bit of how, about how it works, uh, just before we kind of touch back on it in the slides. At a high level, it works with a few tricks of the PowerShell trade. Aliases win over anything. So the first step is to basically turn git, the command, into an alias. In this case, it's an alias to the function use git. So if I get command git, see, it's an alias. You won't really notice most of the time. You know, PowerShell doesn't deeply care. But once we can override git, we can add extra parameters and parse its output. Um, there's a couple ways that I'll refer to this general technique. When it's talking about a command specifically, I will call this command interception. Overall, when you're saying, I want to take another command as base and use that and write a wrap around that. That's command inheritance. But we don't have to get too deep into there, that today. We do this in you get with get you get extensions. I can use get you get extension to get them. You get as a module only has three commands at this point. Use get, out get, and get you get extension. I feel like one of these does not belong, but whatever. So these are all the extensions that are currently there. An extension can apply to either use git or out git. One that applies to use git changes input parameters. One that applies to out git changes how you parse it. So here's all of our out git. We've got a lot of those. And here's all of our use git. And we've just got a few of those. Each extension will return a property bag. So you are basically, okay, I'm getting a bunch of strings. I'm going to turn them into a property bag, turn that into a uh, basically pseudo-typed object, and then you can use a types.ps1xml or format.ps1xml to extend that. And that's it. That, that's your sexy demo before we go back to the boring slide deck, sorry. Um, but it's pretty crazy, right? Like, it, it's just a lot of power in Git already exposed more elegantly in PowerShell. And it is kind of life-changing. So now that we've passed that, let's kind of talk about command interception. Again, it works off of a trick, two tools, and a few techniques. The trick is command interception, right? And that is PowerShell will resolve commands, alias, function, commandlet, external script application. Git.exe would actually naturally come last. Anything you put ahead of that would override it. If I define an alias, PowerShell will override that application. If I define a function, PowerShell will override that application. I'm happy. 
I can still pass down arguments using splatting. So I can just take a single parameter, value from remaining args, and splat. And the most simple example, like the most Spartan one-liner you can have about this is this. Like if you were to do your own uget, there you go. I mean, that's not exactly the code that I've got in use git. It's gotten longer and more complicated, but that is the most primitive form of how you could do command interception. You can do this for any command. You could build your own, essentially, you get for whatever the hell you'd like. So now that we've kind of established that, let's understand a little bit more about how this works. You get is module few commands, again, three. Intercepting is only one part of the problem. We also need to handle each git command independently. That's the extensibility part. We could do this in one script. It would get messy. I could have one big script that just says, all right, I had output from git. If it looks like this, if it looks like that, do this, do that. It's a lot better to build this piecemeal. What the hell is piecemeal, right? Well, piecemeal is a PowerShell module that extends or adds extensibility to any other PowerShell module. It's a build time tool. You basically use piecemeal to generate a function, in this case, get you get extension, that will take a naming pattern and give you all the commands back with a bunch of bells and whistles. So you can make your own copy by using install piecemeal. That is how get you get extension was written. Bonus points, that's got to work or GitHub action in it, and it's right there in the workflow. So if you wanted to see how you'd integrate it into your own project, just literally look at you get or one of the half dozen, dozen other projects that I use that use piecemeal to add extensibility. It's a very useful module. This lets us find extensions related to a given command. And this is actually a cool general purpose trick. Did you all know you could have a validate script or a validate pattern on the param or above the parameter block of a script block. It doesn't naturally do anything, but you can put one there. And for me, this is actually pretty easy to read and understand once you kind of get that you can do that. If you have a validate pattern or a validate script at the top of a script block, that's its validity condition. I should not run this script unless that is true. Makes sense, right? So, Basically, what I'm doing is I'm saying for each of these potential things, for like a git log extension, does my command line start with git log? Okay, cool, I'll parse you. Does my command line start with git add? Cool, I'll parse you. Does my command line start with git push? Cool, I'll parse you. Does my command line include, include a space followed by dash O? You're outputting a file. Yeah, I'll parse you. This is one good simple example of just how open-ended this approach can be, and that's just using patterns. You can do a lot more with validate script. It's okay. So that's the extensibility portion of it and how it works. If you want, and we have the time to get to it, let me quickly look at our clock here, then we can come back to how some of those extensions actually work or see a few in action, but this is mainly a concept level talk. Do we all kind of hopefully understand why you don't want to write one big monolith to parse everything in Git and how this approach is working to split this up? Also, obvious attached benefit to me, this means that I'm not parsing what I don't think I can. So I, I'm opting in to saying I think I can handle the output from Git here. So bisect for instance, is not something I've written support for yet. If you did uh, Corey Knox's talk yesterday on Bisect, nothing that he talked about should be impacted by this because you get, we'll just say, I don't have a parser for git bisect and just return it back normally. Make sense? All right, cool. Now let's talk about how we get sleek. Although I really wish my diff formatter was working. Let me. I'm going to tempt fate one more time here. Just going to ask. No? Ah, never mind. Um, getting sleek. The last bit of you get magic comes from the extended type system. Who knows what the hell that is? Really? 
Okay, uh, one. The extended type system is a wonderfully powerful part of PowerShell that has existed since the beginning. It's what allows you to extend any given object, to add script methods and properties to it, and to say, by say being a file info, you will automatically have these script methods and properties attached. It's also the formatting subsystem, it's kind of sister, that'll basically say, I have an object, how would I like to render it? These are both as old as PowerShell v1. And this is undersung part of PowerShell lets you define custom formatting, methods, or properties on types. So I can basically say, hey, you're a git log entry. I don't actually have to have a real .NET type of being a git log entry. I can just say you are by giving you a PS type name and a hash table and casting you into PS custom object. And at that point, I can add new methods and I can format you. And thus, I can make a git log look like a table. This lets us show git objects as sleek, colorized output. It also allows us to add script methods to git output so we can run related commands. And these are defined in ugit.format.ps1xml and ugit.types.ps1xml. And you might be a little bit scared uh, oh crap, there's this whole new facet of PowerShell that I hadn't heard about that's really cool and useful and I don't have any idea how to use it and what am I gonna do? PS1 XML is hard. I wrote a module a long time ago called Easy Out. I, I mean, yeah, I, I think there was in the course you did. <laughs> yes. This is a fair you know, hit there. Um, Easy Out is actually the oldest PowerShell module. It was written back in the days of PowerShell modules being called packages uh, in like one of the betas for V2. Uh, it is still incredibly useful. It abstracts formatting and types in the commandlets. Uh, there's also a GitHub action around it, so I can just check in my format.ps1s or my types directories and call it a day. Uh, like piecemeal, Easy out is a build time module. I don't think I really emphasize this enough, but basically both of them, you don't need to require the module that you're using to build it to be distributed with the module you build. You just install UGit. You do not have to install piecemeal. You do not have to install easy out. They build a part of UGit at build time. Is this sort of kind of making sense? Although I know we're all working in an interpreted language and it's like build time for PowerShell commands? What the hell is that? Drop by Thursday, 9 a.m., assuming I actually am awake, and I will tell you. Um, going on, you get is built with easy out, but installing you, it does not require you to install easy out or piecemeal. Formatting types can be defined in nice small files. Yeah, star.format. .ps1 files beneath slash formatting or views are automatically pulled up. That's it. And you write a format in there, it will realize that there's where your formatters are and it will create a format.ps1 XML for you. And directories beneath slash types will be treated as the type name. And then underneath there, a get or set underscore property will become script property and blah.ps1 would become a script method. So it's actually really easy to just say, I'm gonna create a pseudo type for ducks and start and create a types directory ducks and create a little you know, quack.ps1 and then you can create a duck object and run your quack method. Crazy. So that's what easy out does and what it brings to this uh, little table. And that's kind of the end of where we're at as far as how it works. Uh, we can pause a little bit here because we have a little bit of extra time at the rate that I'm going uh, before we talk about object pipelines in the cloud or we can keep moving. If we want to pause here and anybody has questions or curiosities or wants me to open up the hood of one of these things so you can get a sense of how they work, do we want to pause for a bit and open up the hood or keep going through? Yes, please, okay. Cool. So let's take a look 
at one of these extensions. Oh, I don't want to look at git pull. Let's look at git clone for a second. Not that one. I haven't looked at this in a bit. Shouldn't be that complicated. Famous last words. Well, for one, you have help. Right? You have nice inline help. What is this doing? Hopefully you have an example or two. Remember I said to use validate script block or validate pattern? That's how I know I'm dealing with git clone. And again, this is a general technique. You can use piecemeal to have this general technique in any module for any purpose. It's a great general technique of basically saying, validate attributes on my script block are conditions for my script block. Right? Now, what you're passing to that condition, what those conditions mean, those are contextual. But as a high-level approach, as a way to logically get other things you can do with PowerShell, pretty easy, I think, once it sinks in. If you see a validate pattern or a validate script or validate anything above the param block, it is probably the condition under which it should run. So let's see how bad clone is. Uh, all right, well, we, collect, collect, we create a collection of git clone lines. I look for this particular one bit of output from there. This is the annoying part. There's some regexl. I actually did have a slide on a regular. I did take it out because I wanted to go in more other stuff, but I have another module for helping you write regexes if this scares you, and I understand if this would scare you. Um, this one, I, I just picked one at random, I'm sorry. But this is basically what their percentages look like, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna regex translate and scare myself for a second. Okay, so this is a named capturing group, and that's P, probably for percentage, and that's digits repeated, yeah, followed by percent, followed by some white space, followed by a broken person that can read regex raw, um, followed by another named capture group that is uh, the count, I guess, which is another series of digits divided by, I'm gonna guess the total, and another closing parentheses, and yes, I have done regex too long. This is what happens to you when you write a module to make a given space a little bit easier for yourself as you slowly but surely become badass in it. So give me a couple years and I'll like be able to tell you all sorts of craziness and get. I mean, it's already sort of starting. But, you know. <laughs> Which one? Uh, irregular, uh, and if anybody is going to tech mentor, I'm giving a talk about irregular or tech mentor this year. So, yeah, um, I actually could probably write that one out in irregular, but I don't want to spend the time on it because I have cooler shit to show you. Sorry, I'm being a little bit more PG-13 in this talk than I mean to. Ah, uh, but that's all we needed to do for write progress. Just that evil regex. But then we can actually turn it into a proper write progress just by, yeah, matches C over matches D, and there's our percent complete. Easy enough, if we had a progress ID, we're gonna close the progress bar. If we had a destination, we're gonna go figure out, you know, what that destination is, and we're gonna go get the URL. So then I return an object that says I cloned to the desk path with the URL which, side note, is a lot more useful than just returning nothing when you clone. What is up, Git? Sorry, rant over. But hey, if I didn't have a destination I could figure out, I'll just give you the, the output lines from clone. They're almost all that simple. I mean, I think probably Git logs, probably one of the more complicated ones, but most of them are just, you're gonna give me two or three lines of output and I'm gonna parse those two or three lines. Get status, I guess, is a little complicated too, but for the most part, they are, you're valid for this pattern, I'm going to go parse you. And if you have a problem with anyone, file an issue. I mean, to err is human. So that's how one of those works. And let's talk a little bit about the types and formats. Let's keep an eye on our time too, because I do want to get to the cool stuff. So in formatting here, let's go look at how we format our clone. This one, again, is a little bit fancy. I'm doing some colorization. Write format view is command and easy out. I say I'm going to format a clone. It's going to write 
the text clone and the property git URL in the foreground color success, which will tend to be green, and into, with spaces around it, a directory in a foreground color verbose. So, by the way, the reason that this is success and verbose is so that it will match whatever color scheme you use. So if you do have a terminal color scheme, it will still try to show the right color for these circumstances, or at least whatever your color scheme thought was the right color, your color scheme might suck. I don't know. So it was a format, PS1, sort of making sense. Just to kind of show this the year. Actually, I sure, probably should have loaded this before the demo for one part of it. But um, I'm going to go import module easy out, which is currently on. Oh, it is publicly on version like 196, and now I'm actually very curious how badly this will go. Uh, I, I don't use this laptop as much, just for presentations. So uh, you should be able to just to run this directly, and you will get that nasty, long PS1 XML file worth of content. Let's try one more time and see if I have something more like a scroll bar here. There might be one there, but I can't see it. So, yeah, I think scrolling around in this output, in this setup is gonna be a little tricky, I'm sorry. But at a high level, you can directly run this and get your XML back. You can easily import easy out and use the easy format file that most of these will have at root, which, hell, you can write easy format file. This is one I did last year for this iron scripter, just bang, now you have a formatting file. Or now you have the thing that will generate a formatting file, go start to write format.ps1s and types and call it a day. As far as types go, let's check out that and keep an eye on our clock, okay. All right. So as far as types go, uh, yeah, let's, let's take a look at git branch. Some of these are easy. Delete method and git branch. Well, the one thing I do have to keep doing is I keep tapping push and pop into your git repo so that all your pathing works as expected, right? And so that if you randomly store this new variable, go five other directories away, it'll still work, right? But aside from that, if I want to delete a branch, I just git branch dash d. And again, if I wanted to make sure that Git will treat this as its argument, not my argument, I can just throw it in single quotes. I can pass this dot branch name, and this is actually cool. I can just pass any remaining arguments you pass to the method directly onto Git. What? Sweating's nuts, right? Uh, this one's a little bit more fun and complicated. Also, very expensive to run. But is this branch tracked yet? I mean, you'll get the error if you try to push, but you might want to know, right? You can actually get that information from git remote show. But if I wanted to have a branch know whether it was tracked itself, I actually have to go ask that command. And to get git remote show to work, I have to know the name of your remote, which I have to get with git remote. So git remote, just return the name of the remote, type back to git remote show, which will actually tell me all the remote information, select object expand pop remote branches, now I know which ones are the remote branches and where the branch name is like this. And like star this because ref star or slash stars for upstream branches that you hadn't locally cloned yet. And other fun scenarios. So yeah, it's not really that complicated, each of these things. The extension's not that complicated, a formatter is not that complicated, a types it's not that complicated. Once you have the right tools to build all this, it's really easy to keep building it out. And you get ain't going anywhere for a number of reasons, not the least of which is I use it every day, literally. Like, as soon as I had it as a module, I put it in my profile. It is literally the only module that is in my profile, and I use it every single day for everything that I do with Git. And I'm about a year in now, so far, it's been mostly benefits with an occasional, what's going on, bug? But mostly good. And it's about to get a lot better. Oh, 
Git. I've only made like five Git jokes here. Six. Anyway, so let's talk object pipelines. Uh, let's talk actually slides that didn't get their animations. Uh, if you take an object's pipeline, or a pipeline's output, and you save it out to the cloud, you can query it and reuse it for later. So you get will give us git as objects, and if we put that up in the cloud, what do we get? Well, potentially a very useful project or product. Now, um, let's ask for a little bit of collective honesty before I go to my next slide, which I guess probably also won't have its animations prepped. How many of you work with Git now? How many of you work with multiple people on Git now? How many of you or your managers have any clue what is going on with Git? Like, who's doing what? What are they doing? And I, I, guess, I, I guess now I can, because that is what we built. Git logger is now open beta. You can go try it. It is a PowerShell built project, basically launched for the summit, that'll let you throw your logs into Git, Git logger and get easy visualization in the cloud and standardized metrics. It's a dollar repo a month. Don't use GitHub, we don't care. As long as it's a Git repository, you Git does not care. We will happily ingest that data too. You don't trust the cloud, we can help you set up a private instance. I mean, honestly, if you don't want me to do any cloud storage on your behalf and you're still happy to give me money, what's, what's to hate there? As far as good partnership, we have talked with PowerShell Universal and we can set you up with a fully customized dashboard. Heart's desire if you want it. So what are you waiting for? Git logger. That's gitlogger.com. And let's give at least a bit of a taste. I will say, beta started today and uh, probably already has an issue or two to deal with aesthetically and underwise. Um, I know we have a couple of things inside of the visualization that I don't like. But we talked about standardizing metrics. Well, here's some of the ones that we can give you at this point. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this probably during lightning rounds and probably on Thursday as well. Uh, but basically, these are all also little, you could think of them as extensions, little naming convention, startup, PS1, what? Oh, yeah. Uh, maybe. There we go. So we got attach rate, percentage of commit messages that reference an issue, number of requests, busy day of week. We also got a busy month at this point. Churn, average number of files in commit. Commit cadence, how often are you committing basically by time? Commit count, repeats. Issue breadth, how much can I work on or how much have I worked on? Line cadence, line change, net line cadence and net lines change. We're just getting started with this. It's really exciting because, well, now I can raise my hand. I can actually tell you what is going on with our repos. And let me take you over to the Azure function. And let's take a look at some of them if I can actually get to see the screen myself. My goodness, this projector font. I am sorry. So we're gonna take a look at GitLogger's own stats in a sec. So, so it's just defaulting the lines change, not attach rate, so let's go get attach rate. Attach rate's the percentage of issues that actually mention a commit. And this is a stat that we've had for a couple of months, or I'm sorry, a couple of weeks. Uh, when we got the stat, everybody was by about at 12%. And I was like, okay, well, we're trying to do all this work here, obviously not being organized enough. I know we're building the tool to tell, but okay, now we can tell. Can we all get better attach rates? Can we all start mentioning what we're working on? And honestly, my late night drawing, dragging this down, I was up at like 60% before I 
did a bunch of aesthetic tweaks. Um, but hey, that one's not necessarily as cool. You want to see a few pictures that speak a thousand words. Well, this is a pretty new idea. How new? Well, we crewed up in February. Eh, that wasn't that bad of a month. March started to get a little long. I need sleep. My team needs sleep. At a glance metrics. Oh, you want to see my pie graph? There you go. Line graph? There you go. Let's go look at lines changed. That's a little terrifying. Anybody know Jake Bolton and Monkey? Yeah, well, he's a beast. 20,000 lines since we started working on this project. Oh, we can go by the month series as well. So how much has Jake done for me in April? Oh, boy. I feel bad now, actually. To be, to be really fair, I've been trying to be more manager than pure implementer here. And you know, to be really, really fair, I've also had to do a lot of cleanup work. And then we get to something like net lines change. And, yeah, you know, I guess I hadn't taken away as I much as I thought. Again, after last night, I'm back in the positive. But you're seeing there's data to be found here. There's insight into teams just off of what's going on in commits. I can also see something like high level, who can I trust to handle the most issues? Well, in February, nobody. April, I've handled 25, no, 20, 26 issues. I point, to point this in another directory here. So if I want to feel like a real beast, let's talk, well, you get itself or PipeScript. So there's me and my bot. I've done 18 issues this month. My bot has touched 14. Almost all the work this month in you get has been PowerShell, a little bit of YAML. I have not repeated myself in a commit. Seriously, this is a pet peeve of mine. Please give me something, commit message, and definitely don't say like updating blah, updating blah, updating blah, updating blah, again and again and again. That's not helping. <laughs> That's why we've created a metric to stop it. And you know, I've only had 28 commits this month. So it's not been that many times banging my head against the wall just enough to form a slight bruise. So that's you know, Git logger as it is now. If any of you are interested in this, hit me up after. Uh, I'd love to make sure we get your contact info and get you in the beta. Uh, if you just want to not say anything to anybody and just get set up, it is pretty easy. We got set up instructions. We got a GitHub action already. That's it. You just copy and paste those two lines in your workflow and start you know, throwing in your data. We don't need to take your credit card now. We have everybody's email. I'm sure we can get somebody. You know. We can also push changes directly, and this is using a bunch of UGIT, but we can fetch on shallow. That's give us our deep history, and then basically go get a remote, and then get a remote URL so we know what the real repo URL is. And then we basically do git log with double dash stat which gives us lines changed uh, total and number of lines changed in each file and each language or type of file. And we massage the commit dates, so SQL is a little bit more happy. We join a couple of things together, again, so SQL is likely to be a little bit happy. Or, and we throw it up into the cloud, literally. Like, oh, hey, do I have an endpoint? Cool. Um, go pass to this endpoint whatever my URL was, minus some you know, punctuation, and the body is all my data, and all the data. And that's it. Then all your logs are aggregated, and we're good to go. And you can query them and get some insight in your teams, and you can either bring that to your bosses and be like, look how cool I am, or show that to your bosses and be like, look, we got a problem here. Yeah, we got a problem here. The fact of the matter is, though, we are in an industry of naked emperors, and we also have had a perpetual problem in improving quality of source. So having things like this, fingers crossed, can go a long way to alleviating some of the industry pains. And we are now a minute from close. And I did my little product launch. You guys like you yet? 
Cool. You like Git logger? You like Git logger? Cool. You get it all yet? Hopefully. We've talked about how it worked through how it works from beginning to end. We've seen how to intercept commands. We've learned how to build piecemeal, which makes all of our modules more extensible. We've improved our regular our regex skill set with regular at our side. We know how to make sleep output with easy out. We've shown that there's more one way than one way to build a module and skin a cat. Oh, I didn't really draw this contrast, but let me underline it. You could spend whatever number of hours learning crescendo, another number of hours trying to build the perfect crescendo JSON file to map whatever command line executable to whatever command lit that you'd like, and that might end up being wasted time compared to command interception. So I, I would encourage others to try this sort of a trick. We've also seen what getting data into the object pipeline can do. And you get it? Good. Any questions? One in the back. How many random Git parameters can you figure out to do something like that? I don't keep count of that. Definitely the search. Definitely, like searching actual file contents, not just like the commit message was, I mean, it makes sense, but it's also just mind blowing. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other highlights. Uh, I guess stuff like, like double dash stat or like looking at diff changes particularly like has been insightful. Um, I've also, I, for a lot of these projects, I find myself spending more time than I would like in their HTML documentation. So it's like I, I'd say an hour of my weekend was just reading Git log docs, just like, all right, so I'm not gonna mess up that parameter, I'm not gonna pass up that parameter. I already know about these ones, don't wanna wrap those ones, don't wanna, ooh. So, yeah. Um, any other questions? For git clone? Well, you know, well yeah, we already have no, them. No, but, but actual command domains that, that are discoverable, like, you know. Not really. I mean, I, I have a few. I don't think I have clone, but I have, I think I have like four or five high level git wrapping commands in PS DevOps. Like, I think I have a push git and maybe uh, like a, not a submit git, something like that. Uh, checkpoint git. Uh, there, this is actually a good example of where this starts to fall apart really quickly. Just in picking appropriate matching verbs, right? Ask yourself, what verb could I pick? What verb noun pair could I pick for git clone that'll be easier for people to remember than git clone? <laughs> I mean, no, seriously, because like, there, I can truly try I can really, really try. I can, I might try to build like something that's, you know, get git clone, start git clone. Those almost highlight where I've come to this point. I love PowerShell and I love what verb noun pairing has done for us, but we need to move past it. Because at the end of the day, sometimes it is extra bulk and noise. And git clone is a fantastically small example. There's a million pieces of documentation on the web that reference git clone. If I choose to make a separate PowerShell command for it, there are whatever number of references to that compared to that million. The muscle memory for git clone is pretty well established. The copy and paste ability of git clone is pretty well established. Either I try to make the whole world adopt my view of PowerShell or we meet them a little bit where they stand. And so, no, I don't really have tons of like intention to take especially this module and go start building out a million and one extra commands because this is, like a lot of modules, an attempt to figure out how to keep growing the language without having a million and one commands. If I have a million and one commands, you guys, uh, traditionally tend to get an experience we call commandlet overload. Oh, I did git command module blah. Ah! Where do I get started? 
and that makes it all a harder learning curve. The thing that I love about this approach is you get to keep your muscle memory. You get to add to it too. You do have you know, extended parameters now. You can get used to tabbing a few more things, but everything else that you're used to in Git should work right. Sorry for the very full-throated answer. Next question. I have not tried yet. I, um, the question was, does it work with Git LFS? Uh, I have only had one repo where I've tried to use Git LFS, and I very quickly determined I should really upload things to YouTube instead. Um, that repo is rough draft. It's, it's another wrapping and executable you know, repo. That one does actually have a bunch of PowerShell commands and crap loads of parameters to wrap uh, FFmpeg, so like edit media or join media, new media. And for that one, sure, I might want to test in a sample video or two, or check in a sample video or two, but yeah, the, the pain was not worth it. Um, I have not tested, I do not know if it does not, I am happy to make changes to support it, just file an issue. So I do not have any other special LFS support in there, but I would not be opposed to adding it, just FYI. Uh, anybody else? Yeah. Say what? Uh, I believe, if I remember correctly, that pretty is one of the, so the validate pattern will say what I will accept. It won't be as great about saying what I will not. Any of the extensions can, at any moment, just break and say, I won't do anything more. And don't, no, no, I'm not actually, I said I would parse this, but I'm not going to parse this. And right now, I'm pretty sure git log double dash pretty is in the, oh, no, sorry, sorry, didn't mean to. Not gonna do it. I might eventually get there because if you get creative enough, that should be actually extractable, but um, it might not necessarily be desirable, if that makes sense. So let me know. I didn't think anybody would want to override parameters in the first place, but basically every hand shot up for that last year or so. One other thing I want to do with dash pretty that would probably be more of a bonus parameter than using it directly um, would be having pretty sort of directly output JSON for specialized fields and having something like a tab completer for some of those just because I've spent enough time in my life already looking through that list. You know, so anybody else? Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, I mean, that's one of the things we're doing with the, the dash after parameter, is we're basically taking what was a double dash parameter and turning it into a dash after. And yes, you could basically say, I'm building a PowerShell parameter on top of my intercepted command, right, that takes dash whatever your underlying slash parameter was, let's call it dash help, right? And when you pass dash help, you can basically say, instead of splatting down this directly, I will instead pass you slash help. So yeah, you could use that. That's a fine and good scenario for it. Um, I think like there are a lot of XEs that could get very interesting to wrap with this approach. The one that I keep meaning to get around to is Docker. Uh, that'll be fun when I do. Does anybody else have like, I really, really want this XE wrapped also already got FFmpeg, so no, no cheating on that one. But you should check out Rough Draft, it is a pretty cool module. Um, so what other XEs do you have to use all the time that you hate? Okay, so however that's pronounced this week. Uh, anybody else? So Docker and Kubernetes. 
Anybody else really have a, an XE they're forced to use enough that they would want PowerShell output for it? IP config. You know what? You're probably right. You probably are. <sighs> you know what else could probably use one that I would, I'm, I'm really regretting even realizing this and saying in the talk, the net command on Windows. Oh, actually, this is a much better high-level topic. Do we have anybody in the room that's very Linux happy? Shucks. Okay, one. Um, there is a, a less love has been given to this project than I'd like, a project uh, called PowerNix that is basically starting a collection of PowerShell utilities for Linux specifically. And this is an approach that I've been meaning to bring back to that because in that universe, I think it makes a lot more sense. It's like I could try to wrestle all of the, you know, command line knowledge away from a Linux person to get them to adopt PowerShell and they would be really mad at me. But if I could take your Linux basic command line output and always turn it into objects, I think, think people would think that would be pretty cool. So, I mean, I guess technically that's what I'm doing here. You get, didn't exactly come from the world of Windows. The Windows did eventually say, you know what? We don't need our own source control system. We'll use yours. All right, so any more questions? We officially close at like 11.45, right? I'm not uh, supposed to go an hour and a half, right? <laughs> cool. Well, and I'm sorry for going a little bit over, but I hope you all had fun. You get it now? You're good. <laughs>